During an aerial tour of the devastated Northeast, President Eisenhower, shocked at the havoc, follows the path of destruction in the country's worst flood. And of ruin, there is plenty for the president to see. For what was once one of the nation's most prosperous regions, a series of small industrial towns, are now sodden heaps of wreckage. These were once thriving manufacturing communities, whose products were the handiwork of Yankee craftsmen. Now their remains stand under the watchful eyes of National Guardsmen on the lookout for prowlers and looters. For the government and all relief agencies have taken over and an attempt is made to assess the damage toll that already has reached into the billions. The immediate needs, food, medical attention to guard against the grim specter of disease. Already $75 million in federal funds is being made available for the most pressing relief work with more to be voted by Congress as necessary. The president has urgently asked all Americans to aid their stricken fellow citizens. Meanwhile, with characteristic courage, the digging out begins for the long pull back. Mountains of debris must be removed and communications restored, but come back it will, for this is one of the cradles of America's greatness. North Africa is aflame with civil war, which from day to day grows in intensity. The tide of battle shifts from Algeria to Morocco almost hourly, as completely aroused nationalist natives take on the full military might of France. Hit and run raids leave villages in flames, often with most of their inhabitants massacred. All roads are under guard and barricaded, passable only to the French military. Even as talks between Arab leaders and the French take place, the unbridled fury of the guerrilla warfare continues. With two and a half divisions deployed and French reservists called up, the rebels continue to fight, but at a cost. Already, 1,700 are dead. Not even hospitals are spared in the savage struggle. As for the non combatants they, as always, are the pawns in a rebellion whose seeds are sown deeply. A crucial day for the unity of Western Europe approaches as elections come due in the Tsar to determine the future of this highly industrialized region, long a source of friction between France and Germany. Political warfare is at a high pitch, a battle to sway the decision of the electorate on approval or rejection of the Franco-German treaty, Europeanizing the industrial heartland of the continent by giving equal economic rights to both nations. Saar Premier Joseph Hoffmann, a pro-French leader, has had many rallies broken up by violence, organized, he charges, by German political factions. The treaty rousing these partisan passions was the price of French consent to a general German peace treaty and admission to NATO. Its rejection by the voters of the Tsar will shake the unity of NATO to its very core and cast the future of the Western alliance itself into doubt. As a byproduct of the Northeast floods, 24 passengers narrowly escape death in the swollen Concord River as a Boston to Montreal train crashes into a tank car which had become detached from a freight train. The tank car is hurled into the river while the cars of the passenger train hang precariously to the edge of the trestle. A car catching the edge of the embankment saved the whole train from the river plunge. Meet the Thing, as the Marines call their newest tank destroyer, a radical vehicle to carry out radical battlefield tactics. It packs 606 millimeter recoilless rifles instead of the usual big artillery piece. Each rifle is aimed by a 50 caliber spotting machine gun. The Thing is designed to move in a 40 mile an hour speed limit, hit and run. The Defense Department films show its firepower. Bad news for tanks. 